Senator Rennick. Okay, uh, thank you, Acting uh, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> uh, tonight, I just want to uh, basically talk ag again about the lack of safety testing that was carried out with the vaccines. Uh, and I also want to discuss the biochemistry once again because there's a lot more uh, elements that I need to discuss that I didn't get to last time. Uh, if you want to look at my last clip, you can still see it on my website. Um, but I will recap just the, the finer points of it. Effectively, this, this vaccine produces a spike protein. It's uh, unlike a normal vaccine that produces 28 proteins and the virus uh, that has 29 proteins in it. This uh, vaccine only takes one of those proteins. Now, because of that, it is a much, much smaller molecule and it can crossfire the endothelium uh, into the capillaries uh, and go throughout the bloodstream. And we know that because in the uh, TGA non-clinical report on page 45 was a distribution table of the rats where it showed the distribution of the spike protein throughout the uh, sorry, not the spike protein, my apologies, of the lipid nanoparticle throughout all the organs in the actual rat. I did say spike protein, but that's not true because they never actually tested the spike protein at all. I mean, that's like testing a bomb without the actual explosives inside of it. What is the point of actually testing the vaccine if you didn't put the spike protein in it? No, what they did was they used a benign enzyme called luciferase and they tested that in the rats. Um, but anyway, long story short, went throughout the whole body, despite the fact that we were told initially that it was only going to stay close to the injection site. Now, the second point we need to note out, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, is the fact that they used this process called transfection. Now, what that means is it bypasses. This is a uh, makes the lipid catatonic, cationic, cationic. I'll get it wrong again. Cationic, and means it bypasses the ACE receptor and the transmembrane serine protein that is required for the virus to actually enter the cell. So, therefore, it is a lot more infectious. Okay. The other thing is that the protein that they did deliver, the spike protein, is not the same as the spike protein in the vaccine, uh, in the virus. Sorry, the vaccine spike protein replaced uh, uridine with a synthetic molecule that's not found naturally in the human body called methyl pseudouridine. Uh, now, studies showed they used that because they wanted to avoid uh, evade the immune system when the actual lipid nanoparticle was delivered to the cell membrane, uh, step one, and it was also shown to have greater self-amplifying properties, which, in other words, it made more of the protein. It also had another 70 adene uh, a nucleotide stuck to its polytail, which meant it lasted a lot longer in the body, and it also had two proline insertions, proline and amino acid, in position 986 and 987 to give it greater strength and stability. Right? So, in other words, it's going to take longer to break down in your body uh, than the normal virus. Um, now, the other thing that we need to touch on is in the studies, they actually showed that your body delivered an IG, uh, IgG response, uh, which is the antibody that you see that you know, basically is your prime antibody in your blood. Uh, now, the problem with that is, is that it's a respiratory airborne virus, so it comes down through your mucosal system, and your, your predominant antibody in your uh, mucosal system uh, is your immunoglobin A. So it's all very well getting an immunoglobin G response or a T cell response, but that's only one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is that you need to see that it's actually going to sterilise the antigen. Right? It's like a football team. You know, my son's football team runs off the field, and I say, "How'd you go, son?" He said, "Oh, we scored 10 points." Well, that's great, but what we need to know is, is that he actually beat the other side. So, if the other side got 30 points, does you know, it doesn't mean that you won. So, you can produce an antibody, but it's got to be you've got to demonstrate that it actually sterilised the antigen. Now, so I touched on that before, and I'll leave it at that. But what I want to touch on is some of the press cracked it last time when I actually spoke about this because I made the mistake of actually comparing the lipids to sausages and they thought I oversimplified that issue. Now, I should just clarify, that wasn't actually my terminology. That was the terminology of the head of the TGA, Professor Skerritt, that he used towards me, uh, said to me in uh, estimates. And I'm just going to quote uh, what he said to me. Uh, I, I asked the question, uh, uh, you know, about the lipids, and he goes, the dose of lipids in the vaccine is below the threshold that, in, that internationally is assessed for genotoxicity and carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenic. So, in other words, you know, yet again, I've said this before, they didn't test it for genotoxicity uh, and, and, and basically cancer. Now, these lipids, this is, this is where Skerritt has misled, Professor Skerritt, uh, head of the TGA, has misled me. These lipids are commonly used in a range of other human therapeutics and even at a higher level higher level, there isn't evidence of anything. Now, let me say this. An absence of evidence isn't uh, evidence of absence. Okay? You need to demonstrate that there are no ill effects. But then he goes on to say that the lipids are hyd hydrolyzed 
uh, and, and destroyed by the bo uh, body fairly rapidly as are dietary lipids, uh, and they are distributed through a range of parts of the body as are lipids that if you have a sausage or steak for breakfast. Okay? So before you start having a crack at me, uh, Ray Hadley and Alice Wokeman, uh, just make sure you go and actually read what was said in estimates initially. Now, the reason why Professor Skerritt has actually misled me on that is that right here I have documents right from Pfizer on their website, uh, and it talks about how they developed their own raw materials to ensure a steady supply for the COVID vaccine. Okay, so it goes on to say that uh, uh, Melissa French, who worked for Pfizer, got the message Pfizer needed large quantities of something called a cationic lipid that was critical to the COVID vaccine. This isn't an everyday lipid that's readily available. Well, 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 well. So we've got Pfizer actually admitting on their own website that the everyday lipid that's been, or the lipid that's been used, isn't isn't an everyday lipid. So when Professor Skerritt said that it's something that you know is in your sausage or steak and it's you know been used in higher levels previously, that is not correct. And this article goes on to say how the, t the Pfizer team had to work overtime to actually get this lipid uh, into production and get it manufactured. So. I find it very concerning that Professor Skerritt would mislead uh, a senator in estimates on that. But we need to talk a little bit further about this, these cationic uh, charged lipids, okay? Because they can be toxic. They're known, or they can uh, disrupt the mitochondrial cellular respiration that's responsible for consuming oxygen for producing energy. If this activity is disrupted, then the oxygen is not reduced all the way to water, and instead to some intermediate trees, which are called reactive oxygen species. Okay? Wow, big term, right? Now, reactive oxygen species are intrinsic to cellular functioning and are present at low and stationary levels in normal cells. However, these can cause irreversible damage to DNA as they oxidise and modify some cellular components and prevent them from performing their original functions. This suggests they have a dual role and, and they can be harmful or protective uh, depending on the balance between their production and disposal at the right time and place. Now, we've got to ask the question why this wasn't tested in humans before it was rolled out. Before it was rolled out. But that's, you know, this, there isn't anything new to this. If we go and look at uh, TGA disclosure log 2387, there's a risk management plan that these guys came up with in January 2021. And I just want to go to table three. Uh, and this, of course, is off the TGA website, so Facebook fact-checkers don't get upset for actually quoting uh, Pfizer's own source documents and the TGA's own source documents. Table 3, a summary of safety concerns in the EU RMP. Okay. Important identified risks, anaphylaxis, important potential risks, vaccine-associated enhanced disease. Right? Lovely. Charming. So they actually knew about this. And the response to all this was to actually, even though that they knew this was a risk, uh, is to basically uh, now what did they say? Go on and say here, it could lead to uh, adverse responses, and it needs to be carefully evaluated once a COVID vaccine rollout commences. Now I don't know about you, but if there is a risk of having a vaccine-enhanced disease, wouldn't you actually test it before the rollout commenced? Uh, and I'll just give you another brief uh, description of what vaccine-associated enhanced disease occurs when an individual who has received a vaccine develops a more severe presentation of that disease when subsequently, subsequently exposed to that virus. Now, this is a well-known phenomenon with dengue fever. There's four different strains of dengue fever. If you get one strain of dengue fever, then your body will uh, basically produce antibodies to that. If you then get another strain of that dengue fever later on, those initial antibodies will kick in, but because it's a different strain, your immune system won't react the way it should as quickly as it should. And that's because the different strain will have a different spike protein. Now, with all these different mutations going around at the moment, if you keep boosting in, you basically run the risk of pathogen priming, okay, which is effectively where you know, the, uh, uh, the viruses that mutate have a greater chance of surviving because your body has only got the antibodies to the initial spike protein and not the nuclear capsid. So you should always have antibodies to not just the S protein but the N protein. And if you look at people who have gone and got their antibody testing after they had COVID, they have antibodies to both the S and N uh, uh, protein. And that's very, very important. So anyway, look, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm just about to run out of time and it looks like I'll have to come back for another session next week. Thank you.
authorised g renic lmp chermside.